The Story of Beowulf, translated from Anglo-Saxon into modern English prose, by Ernest J. B. Kirtland. Part 6. Wiglaf was he called, he who was the son of Wailston, the beloved shield warrior, the prince of the Danes, and the kinsman of Aelfair. He saw his lord suffering burning pain under his visor. Then he called to mind the favor that he, Beowulf, had bestowed upon him in days of yore, the costly dwelling of the Wegmundings, and all the folk rights which his father had possessed. Then he could not restrain himself, but gripped the shield with his hand, the yellow wood, and drew forth the old sword, which was known among men as the heirloom of Eindmund, the son of Othair, in the striving Wailston was banesman by the edge of the sword to that friendless exile, and bore away to his kinsman the brown-hued helmet, the ringed barony, and the old giant's sword that Onala had given him, the war-weeds of his comrade, and the well-wrought armor for fighting. Nor did he speak of the feud, though he slew his brother's son, and he held possession of the treasures many years, both the sword and the barony, until such time as his son should hold the earlship as his father had done. And he gave to the Geats a countless number of each kind of war-weeds, when he in old age passed away from this life on the outward journey. That was the first time for the young champion that he went into the war-rush with his noble lord. Nor did his mind melt within him, nor did the heirloom of his kinsmen at the war-tide, and the dragon discovered it when they two came together. Wiglaf spake many fitting words and said to his comrades, for his mind was sad within him. I remember the time when we partook of the mead, and promised our liege lord in the beer hall, he who gave us rings, that we would yield to him war trappings, both helmets and a hand sword, if such need befell him. And he chose us for this warfare, and for this journey of his own free will, and reminded us of glory, and to me he gave these gifts when he counted us good spear warriors and brave helmet bearers, although our lord, his guardian of the people, had it in his mind all alone to do this brave work for us, for he most of all men could do glorious things and desperate deeds of war. And now is the day come that our Lord hath need of our prowess and of goodly warriors. Let us then go to the help of our battle lord while it lasts, the grim terror of fire. God knows well of me that I would much rather that the flame should embrace my body together with that of my lord, the giver of gold. Nor does it seem to me to be fitting that we should carry shields back to the homestead, except we have first laid low the foe and protected the life of the prince of the wedders. And well I know that his old deserts were not that he alone of the youth of the Geats should suffer grief and sink in the fighting. So both sword and helmet, birney and shield, shall be common to both of us together. Then he waded through the slaughter reek and bore the war helmet to the help of his lord and uttered a few words. Beloved Beowulf, do thou be doing all things as thou of yore in the days of thy youth was saying that thou wouldest not allow thy glory to be dimmed whilst thou wast living? Now shalt thou, the brave in deeds and the resolute noble, save thy life with all thy might. I am come to help thee. After these words came the angry dragon, the terrible and hostile sprite yet once again, and decked in his various hues of whelmings of fire against his enemies, the men that he hated and the wood of the shield was burnt up with the waves of flame, and his burney could not help the young spear warrior. Yet did the youth bravely advance under the shield of his kinsman, when his own had been destroyed by the flames. Then again the war king bethought him of glory, and struck a mighty blow with his battle sword, so that it fixed itself in his head, forced in by violence. And Nagling, Beowulf's sword, old and gray, broke in pieces and failed in the contest. It was not given to him that sharp edges of swords should help him in battle. His hand was too strong, so that it overtaxed every sword, as I have been told by the force of its swing, whenever he carried into battle a wondrous hand weapon, and he was no wise the better for a sword. Then for the third time the scather of the people, the terrible fire dragon, was mindful of feuds, and he rushed on the brave man when he saw that he had room, all hot and battle grim and surrounded his neck with bitter bones, and he was all be-bloodied over with his life-blood, and the sweat welled up in waves. Then I heard tell that the earl of the king of the people showed in his time of need unfailing courage in helping him with craft and keenness, as was fitting for him to do. 
He paid no heed to the head of the dragon, but the brave man's hand was being burnt when he helped his kinsman. But that warrior in arms struck at the hostile sprite somewhat lower in his body, so that his shining and gold-plated sword sank into his body, and the fire proceeding therefrom began to abate. Then the good king Beowulf got possession of his wits again, and drew his bitter and battle-sharp short sword that he bore on his shield, and the king of the Geats cut asunder the dragon in the midst of his body, and the fiend fell prone, courage had driven out his life, and they two together had killed him, noble comrades in arms, and thus should a man who is a thane always be helping his lord at his need, and that was the very last victory achieved by the prince during his life work. Then the wound which the earth dragon had formerly dealt him began to burn and to swell, and he soon discovered that the baleful venom was seething in his breast, the internal poison. Then the young noble looked on the giant's work as he sat on a seat, musing by the cliff wall, how arcs of rock, firmly on columns, held the eternal earth house within. Then the most noble thane refreshed his blood-stained and famous lord, his dear and friendly prince, with water, with his own hands, and loosened the helmet from the battle-sated warrior. And Beowulf spake over his deathly pitiful wound, for well he knew that he had enjoyed the days while of his earthly joy and the number of his days was all departed, and death was coming very near. Now, said Beowulf, I would have given battle-weeds to my son if any heir had been given to me of my body. I held sway over these people fifty years, and there was no folk-king of those who sat around about who dared to greet me with swords or oppress with terror. At home have I bided my appointed time, and well I held my own, nor did I seek out cunning feuds, nor did I swear many unrighteous oaths, and I, sick of my life wounds, can have joy of all this. For the wielder of men cannot reproach me with murder of kinsmen when my life shall pass forth from my body. Now do thou, beloved Wiglaf, go quickly and look on the hoard under the hoar stone, now that the dragon lieth prone and asleep sorely wounded and bereft of his treasure. And do thou make good speed that I may look upon the ancient gold treasures and yearly be feasting mine eyes upon the bright and cunning jewels, so that thereby, after gazing on that wealth of treasure, I may the more easily give up my life and my lordship over the people whom I have ruled so long. Then straightway I heard tell how the son of Wollastan, after these words had been spoken, obeyed the behest of his lord, who was sick of his wounds, and carried the ring-net and the coat of mail adorned under the roof of the barrow. And as Wiglaf, exulting in victory, came by the seat, he saw many gems shining and shaped like the sun, and gleaming gold all lying on the ground, and wondrous decorations on the wall. And he saw too the den of the dragon, the ancient twilight flyer, and flagons standing there, and vessels of men of days long gone by, no longer polished but shorn of adornment. And there also was many a helmet, ancient and rusty, and many arms rings cunningly twisted. The possession of treasure and of gold on the earth may easily make proud all of mankind. Let him hide it who will. Likewise he saw the all-gilded banner lying high over the hoard, the greatest of wondrous handiwork, and all woven by the skill of human hands. And therefrom went forth a ray of light, so that he could see the floor of the cave, and look carefully at the jewels. And there was no sign of the dragon, for the sword edge had carried him off. Then I heard tell how in that barrow one at his own doom plundered the hoard, that old work of giants, and bore away on his arms both cups and dishes. And the banner also he took, the brightest of beacons. Beowulf's sword, with its iron edge, had formerly injured him, who had been the protector of these treasures for a long time, and had waged fierce flame terror, because of the horde fiercely welling in the midnight hour until he was killed. The messenger was in haste, and eager for the return journey, and laden with jewels, and curiosity tormented him as to whether he would find the bold-minded prince of the Geats alive on the battlefield, and bereft of strength, where before he had left him. Then he with the treasures found the glorious lord, his own dear master, at the last gasp, and all stained with blood, and he began to throw water upon him, until the power of speech break through his mind, and Beowulf spake, and with sorrow he looked upon the hoard. I would utter words of thanks to the lord and wondrous king, to the eternal God, for the treasures which now I am looking upon, that I have managed to obtain them for my dear people before my death day, 
Now that I have, in exchange for this hoard of treasure, sold my life in my old age, and laid it down, do thou still be helping the people in their need, for I may no longer be lingering here. Do thou bid the famous warriors erect a burial mound, after the burning of the funeral pyre, at the edge of the sea, which shall tower aloft on whales' nests, as a memorial for my people, and so the seafarers shall call it the Hill of Beowulf, even those who drive the high ships from afar through the mists of the flood. Then he, the bold prince, doffed from his neck the golden ring, and he gave it to his thane, to the young spear warrior, the gold-adorned helmet, the ring, and the birney, and bade him enjoy it well. Thou, O Wiglaf, he said, art the last heir of our race, of that of the Wigmundings. Weird has swept away all my kinsmen to their fated doom, all the earls in their strength, and I shall follow after them. Now that was the very last word of the old warrior's breast thoughts. Ere he chose the funeral pyre, the hot wave whelmings, and his soul went forth from his breast to be seeking the doom of the truth-fast ones. Then had it sorrowfully come to pass for the young warrior that he saw his most beloved in a miserable plight on the earth at his life's end. Likewise the terrible dragon, his slayer, lay there bereft of life and pressed sore by ruin, and the coiled dragon could no longer yield the hordes of rings, but the iron edges of the sword, well-tempered and battle-gashed, the hammer's leavings, had carried him off, so that the wide flyer, stilled because of his wounds, fell to the earth near to the hoard hall, and no more in playful wise at the midnight hour did he drift through the air. This dragon, proud in his gainings of treasure, showed not his face, but was fallen to the earth because of the handiwork of the battle warrior. And as I have heard, it would have profited but few of the mighty men, even though they were doughty in deeds of all kinds, though they should rush forth against the flaming breath of the poisonous scather, even to the very disturbing of the ring hall with their hands, if they should have found the guardian thereof awake, and dwelling in the cliff cave. Then Beowulf's share of lordly treasure was paid for by his death, and both he and the dragon had come to an end of their fleeting days. And not long after that, the laggards in battle, those cowardly treaty-breakers, ten of them together, came back from the woodlands, they who erewhile had dreaded the play of the javelins when their lord had sore need of their help. But they were filled with shame, and carried their shields and battle-weeds to where the old prince was lying. And they looked on Wiglaf, he, the foot-warrior, sat a wary, near to the shoulders of his lord, and sought to rouse him by sprinkling water upon him, but he succeeded not at all. Nor could he, though he wished it ever so much, keep life in the chieftain, or avert a wit the will of the wielder of all things. Every man's fate was decided by the act of God, as is still the case. Then was a grim answer easily given by the young man to these who erewhile had lost their courage. Wiglaf spake, he the son of Wailston, the sad-hearted, he who will speak truth may say that the Lord and Master who gave you gifts and warlike trappings, which ye are now standing, when he very often gave on the ale bench to them who sat in the hall, both helmet and barony, the prince to his thanes, as he could find any of you most noble far or near, that he wholly wrongly bestowed upon you war trappings when war befell him. The king of the folk needed not indeed to boast of his army comrades, yet God, the yielder of victory, granted to him that alone he avenged himself with the edge of the sword when he had need of strength. But a little life protection could I give him in the battle, yet I sought to help him beyond my strength. The dragon was by so much the weaker when I struck with my sword that deadly foe, and less fiercely the fire surged forth from his head. Too few were the defenders thronged around their lord when his fated hour came, and now shall the receiving of treasure and the gift of swords and all joy of home and hope cease for ever to men of your kin. And every man of you of the tribe must wander empty of land rights, since noble men will learn far and wide of your flight and inglorious deed. Death would be better for earls than a life of reproach. Then he bade them announce that battle work at the entrenchment up over the sea cliff, where that troop of earls sat sorrowful in soul through the morning long day, holding their shields, and in expectation of the end of the day and the return of the dear man. And he who rode to and fro o'er the headland was little sparing of fresh tidings, but said to all who were sitting there, Now is the joy-giver of the people of the Geats fast on his deathbed, 
and by the deed of the dragon he inhabits the place of rest gained by a violent death, and by his side lieth the enemy of his life, sick of his dagger wounds. Nor could he inflict with the sword any wound on that monster. Wiglaf sits over Beowulf, he, the son of Wailston, the earl over the other one who is dead, and reverently keeps ward over the loathed and the beloved. But there is an expectation of a time of war to the people, since to Franks and Frisians the fall of the king has become widely known. The hard strife was shapen against the Hugues when Hygelic came with a fleet into the Frisian lands, where the Hetware overcame him in battle, and by their great strength and courage brought it to pass that the shield warrior should stoop. He fell in the troop, nor did the prince give jeweled armor to the doughty ones. The mercy of the mirror wing was not always shown to us, nor do I expect aught of peace or good faith from the Swedish people. But it was well known that Ogenthau bereft Haithsin, the son of Rethel, of his life over against Ravenswood, when because of pride the warlike Swedes first sought out the people of the Geats. Soon Ungenthau, the wise father of Ulther, the ancient and terrible, gave him, Haithsin, a return blow, destroyed the sea kings, and rescued his bride, Queen Elan. He, the old man, rescued his wife, bereft of gold, the mother of Onela, and of Ulther, and then followed up the deadly foe until with difficulty they retreated all lordless to Ravenswood, and he attacked the remnant with a great army, weary though he was with his wounds, and the live-long night he vowed woe upon the wretched troop, and said that on the morrow he would by the edge of the sword, slay some, and hang them up on the gallows tree for a sport of the birds. But help came to the sorrowful in soul at the dawn of day, when they heard the horn of Igalic and the blast of his trumpet, when the good man came on the track, faring with the doughty warriors of the people. And the blood track of both Swedes and Geats, the slaughter rush of warriors, was widely seen how the folk stirred up the feud amongst them. The good man, wise and very sad, went away with his comrades to seek out a stronghold. Earl Ongenthau turned away to higher ground, for he, the war crafty one, had heard of the prowess of Hygelic the Proud. He had no trust in his power to resist, or that he would be able to refuse the demands of the seamen, the oceanfarers, or defend the treasure he had taken, the children and the bride. Thence afterwards, being old, he sought refuge under the earth wall. Then was chase given to the people of the Swedes and the banner of Hygelic borne aloft, and they swept o'er the field of peace when the sons of Rethel thronged to the entrenchment. And there too was Ongenthau, he the gray-haired king of the people, driven to bay at the edge of the sword and forced to submit to the sole doom of Eofor, and angrily did Wolf, son of One Red, smite him with the weapon, so that from the swinging blow blood sweat gushed forth in streams under the hair of his head. Yet the old Swede was not terrified thereby, but quickly gave back a terrible blow by a worse exchange when the king of the people turned thither. Nor could Wolf, the bold son of One Red, give back a blow to the old churl, for Ungenthau, had firmly cut his helmet in two, so that he, stained with blood, fell prone preforce to the ground. But not yet was he doomed, but he raised himself up, though the wound touched him close. And the hardy thane of Hygelic, Eofor, when his brother lay prostrate, caused the broad sword, the old giant's sword, to crash through the wall of shields upon the gigantic helmet. Then stooped the king, the shepherd of the people, mortally wounded, and there were many who bound up his kinsmen and quickly upraised him when the room had been made so that they might possess the battlefield while one warrior was plundering another. One took the iron shield of Ungenthau and his hard-hilted sword and his helmet and carried the trappings of the old man to Hygelic, and he received the treasures, and fairly he promised reward for the people, and he did as he promised. The lord of the Geats, Hygelic, son of Rethel, rewarded with very costly gifts the battle onset of Eofor and Wolf, when he got back to his palace, and bestowed upon each of them a hundred thousand of land and locked rings. Nor could any man in the world reproach him for that reward, since they had gained glory by fighting, and he gave to Erofor his only daughter, she who graced his homestead, to wed as a favor, and this is a feud and the enmity and hostile strife of men, which I expect the Swedish people will seek to awaken against us when they shall hear we have lost our prince. He who in days of yore held treasure and kingdom against our foes after the fall of heroes, and held in check the fierce Swede, and did what was good for the people and deeds worthy of an earl, 
Now is it best for us to hasten to look upon our king, and bring him who gave us rings to the funeral pyre. Nor shall a part only of the treasure be melted with the proud man, but there is a hoard of wealth, an immense mass of gold, bought at a grim cost. For now at the very end of his life he bought for us rings. And the brands shall devour all the treasures and the flames of the funeral fire. They shall enfold them, nor shall an earl carry away any treasure as a memorial, nor shall any maid all beauteous wear on her neck ring adornments, but shall go sad of soul and bereft of gold, and often not once only tread an alien land, now that the battle-wise man, Beowulf, has laid aside laughter, the games and the joys of song, and many a morning cold shall the spear in the hand-grip be heaved up on high, nor shall there be the sound of harping to awaken the warriors, but the war-raven, eager over the doomed ones, shall say many things to the eagle how it fared with him in eating the carrion while he, with the wolf, plundered the slaughtered. Thus then was the brave warrior reciting loathly spells, and he lied not at all in weird or word. Then the troops rose up together, and all unblithely went under eagle's nests to look on the wonder, and tears were welling. Then they found him on the sand in his last resting place, and bereft of soul, who had given them rings in days gone by, and then had the last day drawn to its close, for the good man Beowulf, the warrior king, the lord of the Wiedergoths, had died a wondrous death. But before this they had seen a more marvelous sight, the dragon on the sea plain, the loathsome one lying right opposite, and there was the fire dragon grimly terrible, and scorched with fire, and he was fifty feet in length as he lay there stretched out. He had had joy in the air a while by night, but afterwards he went down to visit his den, but now he was the prisoner of death, and had enjoyed his last of earth cares. And by him stood drinking cups, and flagons, and dishes were lying there, and a costly sword, all rusty and eaten through, as though they had rested a thousand winters in the bosom of the earth. And those heirlooms were fashioned so strongly, the gold of former races of men, and all wound round with spells, so that no man could come near the ring hall, unless God only, himself the true king of victories, gave power to open up the hoard to whom he would, for he is the protector of men, even to that man as it seemed good to him. Then was it quite clear to them that the affair had not prospered with the monster, who had hidden ornaments within the cave under the cliff. The guardian thereof had slain some few in former days. Then had the feud been wrathfully avenged, and it is a mystery anywhere when a valiant earl reached the end of his destiny, when a man may no longer with his kinsmen dwell in the mead-hall. And thus was it with Beowulf when he sought out the guardian of the cavern and his cunning crafts. And he himself knew not how his departure from this world would come about. And thus famous chieftains uttered deep curses until the day of doom, because they had allowed it to come to pass that the monster should be guilty of such crimes. And, accursed and fast with hell-bands, as he was, and tormented with plagues that he should plunder the plain. He, Beowulf, was not greedy of gold, and had more readily in former days seen the favor of God. Wiglaf spake the son of Wailstan, Often shall many an earl of his own only will suffer misery, as is our fate. Nor could we teach the dear lord and shepherd of the kingdom any wisdom, so that he would fail to be meeting the keeper of the gold treasures, the dragon, or to let him stay where he had been long time dwelling, in his cavern, until the world's end. But he held to his high destiny. Now the hoard is seen by us, grimly got hold of, and at too great a cost was it yielded to the king of the people, whom he enticed to that conflict. I was within the cavern, and looked upon all the hoard, the decoration of the palace, when by no means pleasantly room was made for me, and a fairing was granted to me in under the sea cliff. And in much haste I took a very great burden of hoard treasure in my hand, and bore it forth hither to my king. He was still alive, wise, and witting well, and he, the ancient, uttered many words in sadness, and bade me greet you, and commanded that ye should build after death of your friend a high grave mound, in the place of the funeral pyre, a great and famous monument, for he himself was the most worshipful of men throughout the earth, while he was enjoying the wealth of his city. Let us now go, and see and seek yet once again the heap of treasures, the wonder under the cliff. I will direct you, so that ye may look at close quarters upon the rings and the wealth of gold. Let the buyer be quickly made ready when we come forth again, 
and then let us carry the dear man our Lord, when he shall enjoy the protection of the ruler of all things. Then the son of Wailstun, the battle dear warrior, ordered that the commandment should be given to many a hero and householder, that they should bring the wood for the funeral pyre from far, they the folk leaders, to where the good man lay dead. Now the war flame shall wax, and the fire shall eat up the strong chief among warriors, him who often endured the iron shower, when the storm of arrows, strongly impelled, shot over the shield wall, and the shaft did good service, and all eager with its feather, fear followed and aided the barb. Then the proud son of Wailstan summoned from the troop the thanes of the king, seven of them together, and the very best of them. And he, the eighth, went under the hostile roof, and one of the warriors carried in his hand a torch which went on in front. And no wise was it allotted who should plunder that hoard, since they saw some part unguarded remaining in the hall, and lying there fleeting. And little did any man mourn when fully heartily they carried forth the costly treasures. Then they shoved the dragon the worm over the cliff wall, and let the wave take him and the flood embrace that guardian of the treasures. Then the twisted golden ornaments were loaded on a wagon, an immense number of them, and the noble Aetheling, the whore battle warrior, was carried to Walesness. Then the people of the Geats got ready the mighty funeral pyre, and hung it round with helmets and battle shields and bright bairnies as he had asked. And in the midst they lay the famous prince, and they lamented the hero, their dear lord. Then the warriors began to stir up the greatest of bale fires on the cliff side, and the reek of the wood smoke went up swart over the flame, which was resounding, and its roar mingled with weeping, and the tumult of winds was still, until it had broken the body, all hot into the heart, and unhappy in their thinkings, and with minds full of care, they proclaimed the death of their lord, likewise a sorrowful song of the bride, and heaven swallowed up the smoke. Then on the cliff slopes the people of the Geats erected a mound, very high and very broad, that it might be beholden from afar by the wavefarers. And they set up the beacon of the mighty in battle in ten days, and the leavings of the funeral fire they surrounded with a wall, so that very proud men might find it to be most worthy of reverence. And they did on the borrow rings and necklaces, and all such adornments as formerly warlike men had taken of the hoard, and they allowed the earth to hold the treasure of earls, the gold on the ground, where it still is to be found as useless to men as it always was. Then the battle deer men rode around about the mound, the children of the eighthlings, twelve of them there were in all, and would be uttering their sorrows and lamenting their king, and reciting a dirge, and speaking of their champion. And they talk of his earlship, and of his brave works, and deemed them doughty, as is fitting that a man should praise his lord in words, and cherish him in his heart, when he shall have gone forth from the fleeting body. So the people of the Geats lamented over the fall of their lord, his hearth companions, and said that he was a world king, and the mildest, the gentlest of men, and most tender to his people, and most eager for their praise. The End Make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future readings and analysis.